Lord, I thank you so much for Rachel. I thank you, Lord, so much for all that she has brought uh, to us this morning. And Lord, I want to ask that you bless her as she blesses us. And I thank you, Lord, for this important topic of prayer and exploring that in more detail. And, and Lord, I pray today that you might be at work in our lives through Rachel's words. I pray today, Lord Holy Spirit, that you would anoint all that she has to bring and make a difference in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I'm just going to adjust myself because of the sun. So I might keep moving, if that's all right. And I have got a bit of a cold, so my voice is not normally quite so deep and husky. So I apologise for that as well. Um, but it's so great to be here. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. If you don't know me, I'm Rachel, like Ed said. i just confirming that fact in case you thought he wasn't telling the truth. And uh, normally I'm at Woody Central, um, up the road a bit. And it's just so great to be here, because one of the things that I'm quite passionate about is um, not just Woody Central, but all of the churches in our church family. So it's so lovely to be invited to be here. So we're continuing our look at the Lord's Prayer, thinking about prayer. But we're not just thinking about, well, I'm not just thinking about prayer as in how we pray, but also thinking about how this prayer that Jesus taught us teaches us how to not only pray, but teaches us how to live how to be disciples of Jesus, how to be followers of him, how to put in, to practice in our lives what he teaches us to pray. So that's where we're going this morning. And I don't know if if Ed and Deb thought about this, but they've asked me to talk about sin. Maybe they know that I um, have a particular um, uh, experience of of dealing with sin, because I do, obviously, like us all. But this morning, I'm talking about that verse that says, forgive us our sins. And sin is such a difficult word, isn't it, in our culture? It's not really a word that anyone ever uses. You know, you don't sort of, I don't know, do something in the supermarket and say, oh, I've just sinned, you know, because you've forgotten to scan it. I did that last week in Tesco's, forgot to scan my mini eggs. And then I got, I, it's okay, it was all right. I remembered before I got to the checkout, but, I, but, you know, I thought, oh, that's a bit of a sin, isn't it, if I hadn't done it. <clears throat> you just say, oh, you know, that's, I does something wrong or that's not very good. Sin is is a bit of an old-fashioned word. Most people don't really use it. And, you know, I do a lot of... um, I'm involved in the Alpha course at Woody's, and when you talk about sin, people kind of glaze over a little bit because it's not really a word or a concept they understand. Um, The most common word for sin in the Bible is the Greek word... I'm sorry, my pronunciation is not going to be very good. It's hamartia. And it actually stems from an archery term, which you may well know. And actually, what it means... All it means really is missing the mark. So if you have a big archery board and you're aiming your bow and arrow at the centre and you miss the mark, that's really the um, explanation of what sin is. It's about missing the mark. Missing the mark. Missing the mark of God's divine plan for us in how we should live. Missing the mark in doing the things that we know we should be doing but don't do. Missing the mark in thinking the thoughts that we shouldn't be thinking but we are thinking. Missing the mark in how we treat other people. We don't treat them in the way we would like to be treated ourselves. Missing the mark in how we relate to our kids and losing our temper and you know not loving them in the way we should. Missing the mark in driving and getting cross and grumpy with people because they cut us up and rather than blessing them we... Um, say something else. Um, So we all do it. We all miss the mark. None of us here are immune or excluded from that, myself included. We all miss the mark. And that's really what sin is. And so let's look at the the verse um, in context with um, the prayer that Jesus teaches us. I'll just read it to us again. I know it's so familiar, but it, it can never be too familiar. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, how aware are you of sin in your life? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to confess them publicly amongst us all, because that just would take far too long, I expect, to be honest. But we can have various responses to sin, I think, in our lives. We can um, minimise it. It's only a small thing. It's not really a big deal. It doesn't really matter that I forgot to scan my mini eggs, you know. And, uh, in, in, you know, it isn't really a big deal, is it? Because I can pay for them afterwards. Um, or if I get caught, I can apologise, be really embarrassed, go pink, and then say, I'm really sorry I've done this before. Um, but we can minimise the stuff that we do wrong in our lives. We all do it. We all think, oh, it's not really a big deal. It doesn't really matter. Everyone does it. 
Um, so we can have that response to it. Or we can be experts at spotting sin in other people's lives. I'm quite good at this, to be honest, especially with my children. I've had various conversations with my children this week who are all grown up and left home. And I was doing a bit of sin spotting, to be honest, especially when I saw one of them on Be Real, the social media thing. And I, could, I spotted a sin right there in public on social media. So I was very keen to point it out to them. I won't tell you what it was. Um, sorry, Josh, if you're watching this. <laughs> he won't be, so that's fine. Um, but we can be really good at spotting things in other people's lives, can't we? It's kind of almost instinctive. We can see, oh, they're doing something wrong, they're doing something wrong. Oh, they shouldn't have done that. Oh, they shouldn't have said that. Uh, I can tell the, what they're thinking. Um, and, you know, we can spot the speck, the Bible talks about it, and not see the massive great big plank sticking out of our own eye. And I think that is human nature. That's often what we're like. Or we can go the other sort of extreme and just feel totally condemned by our own sin. Feel crushed under the weight of it. Feel like we are the worst person in the world and we have done something, you know, that nobody can forgive, that God can't forgive, that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. Surely when God says he'll forgive me, he didn't mean that. I keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Is he going to keep forgiving me? Is he going to reach a point where he says, no, that's enough. Forgiveness runs out. He can't deal with the thing that I am holding, the thing that I'm carrying. The burden is too much. But do you know what? The Bible is really tuned in to the human condition. The Bible is really aware of our frailty and our, um, you know, our relationship with ourselves and other people, the things we do wrong, the things we say that we shouldn't say, the thoughts we have that we shouldn't have, the things we see with our eyes that we shouldn't be looking at. And the Bible is not shy of talking about the human condition and really articulating how sin doesn't just affect us personally, but it affects those that are around us, it affects our relationships, it affects our interactions with other people, and it also affects our relationship with God, primarily, maybe, and most importantly. Romans 3.23 sums it up like this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is nobody immune from sin. We are all infected, if you want to put it like that. In Mark 9... Verses 43 to 49, Jesus teaches about the seriousness of sin. Now, buckle up, because it's quite a strong passage. And a, and a, however early it is on a Sunday morning, it's pretty full on, but I'm just going to read it. This is Jesus' words. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is never quenched. Wow, there's a lot of cutting off and poking out there, isn't there? <laughs> you know, if Jesus actually meant exactly what he was saying, if, he's, if he is saying we should kind of bring in Sharia law, we would all be sitting here, eyeless, handless, and footless. That is the reality. Of course, he's not actually saying we should have Sharia law, but he is exaggerating. He's speaking in hyperbole to make a point, to say, actually, sin is not okay. It's not okay for us to kind of move in with sin and to be comfy with sin and to give space for it in our lives and feel like it's okay. He is, he's very direct about it. He's very direct about the seriousness of it and the consequences of it, and, the, and what we should do to root it out. And he's not saying that in a condemning way. He's saying that because he's setting, he's setting up in terms of like, I've come to deal with this. I have come to make a way for this. Because sin never leads anywhere good. Never will it lead us anywhere good. And Jesus knows that. Sin damages our relationships with other people. I mean, if you have a relationship with somebody, it doesn't have to be a spouse, it could be a friend, it could be someone you live with, it could be someone you work with, you know that if there's sin around, either in your life or their life, you know, there's things that are, that are not happening in the way they should, it will affect your relationship. 
you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. It, it, it kind of infects everything, how you see each other. You can find yourself reading the wrong signals. You can find yourself being really super sensitive. You can be, feel offended. You can feel like, oh, they're having a go at me. You can kind of, it affects them, it affects you. Sin will always affect our relationship with others, and it, it will spill out in loads and loads of different ways. I, recently, I um, watched that documentary about the Salisbury poisoning, and uh, their names, Sergi and Yulia Skripal, Skripal, I can't say that, were poisoned by that lethal poison, Novichok. And um, it, was, it was a terrible thing, and a, and a lady died. You know, she found the perfume bottle that the poison had been put in and thought it was perfume that she'd found and she sprayed it on herself and very sadly died from it and they they didn't die incredibly but this the poison had been sprayed on um on their door handle and everything they touched there was a little trace of poison it was like a a bench the cutlery on the table that they sat at the chair where they were sitting everywhere that they'd gone through that city had to be found and cleaned and it was a slow laborious process to make sure that every little bit of sin had been eradicated from Salisbury and I think the people who lived there it was just a really terrible time for the whole city where everything had to be sort of shut down but it made me think that you know sin is like that it doesn't just affect us personally when we sin it's not just about us it leaves a trace everywhere we go it spills out of us in different ways, even if it's not a sin that affects somebody else. Maybe it's a private, secret sin that only you know about. Nobody else knows about it. Let's not be naive and think that it won't affect other people, because it will. Because sin is serious, and sin is real, and it will spill out of us, and it will damage our relationship with ourselves, other people, and Jesus. And that's why he's so serious about it. That's why he says, you know, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, because he wants to make a point and say, let's just be serious and real about this. But it doesn't just affect us and other people and our lives. It will damage and restrict and limit our relationship with God. It will. Sin will have this effect on diminishing our connection with Jesus, our connection with the Holy Spirit, and our relationship with God. It has like an incremental effect. And if we don't confess our sin to God, if we don't deal with it, if we're not honest with him and honest with ourselves and ask him to forgive us and go through the process of confession and receiving God's forgiveness... It has this incremental sort of barrier that builds up in our lives, which really affects our relationship with God. You can begin to feel a bit cynical, a bit hard. Joy just seems to be elusive. Why is everybody else so joyful? You feel a bit kind of sarcastic. Your heart, your heart gets a bit hard and tough around the edges. <laughs> God feels distant, and you feel that, the draft of that distance. It's just a horrible place to be. And sin will always become a heavy weight in our lives. Now, I've got an illustration of that. This is my husband's rucksack. It's got his lunchbox in it. Not really. Um, this is his... Um, my husband is an army cadet leader, detachment leader. He leads the detachment at Lawrence Weston with the army cadets. If you know any army cadets, or if you want to join the army cadets, speak to me later. Um, and uh, he loves it. He loves working with the kids down there. Um, but this is one of his rucksacks, and it's actually full of stuff. It's actually quite heavy. It's actually quite heavy. I don't know what's got in it. Loads of junk, basically. Wires and all sorts of things. I think he's got maybe a bomb-making kit. No, not really. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's heavy. It's heavy. And actually, just to wear it now is fine, because I'm not going anywhere. I'm just standing here in front of you lovely people. I don't need... I'm not running at Penny Fan. I'm not going to, you know, do a marathon with it on my back. But it's okay now. I can sort of deal with it. But after a while, it's going to become heavy, It's going to become awkward. I don't want to keep it on all day. I don't want to kind of wear it to bed. I'm not going to be able to sleep with it very easily. I don't want to wear it tomorrow. I don't want to have a shower with it on. But what happens with sin is we end up having this barrier, this sort of this burden that we're carrying around with us. And it's it's heavy and awkward and and it we become really aware of it. Or we become aware of the consequences of it. And I wonder if you had a backpack of sin. What would be in it? 
What would be in it? Would it be anger or pride or unforgiveness? Would it be having a really short temper with your kids? <laughs> Been there, done that for about 20 years. Um, would it be just having thoughts about other people that are wrong? You know, judgmental, cynical. Is it your driving? Do you have an issue, you know, with sin when you're driving? You're really kind of short-tempered and, you know, get really cross with people. Is it the things you do with your hands, like Jesus talked about? The thing, where your feet take you, where your feet make you go, like Jesus said. Or is it the things that you see with your eyes? Are you looking at things you shouldn't be looking at? Seeing things that you shouldn't be seeing? You know, Jesus uses that illustration in Mark to really make a point. Not to make us feel guilty, but to make us wake up to the reality of sin in our lives. And that's the bad news. Sin is real, it is serious, and it affects us all. And it leaves a trace all over our lives. But the really, really, really good news is that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story when it comes to sin. Because Jesus died on the cross and made a way for us to appropriate and experience forgiveness and walk in freedom and lightness. Because Jesus tells us to pray, forgive us our sins in the Lord's Prayer, because he has made a way for us to do that. He has made a way for us to be forgiven. He has made a way for him to forgive us. So when he teaches us to pray, forgive us our sins, it's because he knows we need to and he's made it a route for us to do that. He is, he's opened the way, provided a path, provided a road for us to pray that prayer and experience the forgiveness that we all need and that we all need to have access to. The Apostle Paul looks back at Jesus' death in Romans and says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. We have access to God's mercy and freedom and forgiveness, not because of anything we have done. Very cute boy out here, just saying. <laughs> Very cute. Not because of anything we have done. You know, we can't, we can't do anything to make God forgive us. We can pray, but we can't be good enough or have enough effort in ourselves it's all about what Jesus has done. It's all about his mercy. It's all about his gift to us. And let's face it, we are like a dodgy shopping trolley in Tesco's, aren't we? Or, or another supermarket, all supermarkets together. I don't want to be bad about Tesco's. Little, Aldi, Waitrose, even Waitrose have dodgy shopping trolleys. You know the shopping trolley that you're trying to push, and it's just got a weird wheel, and it just keeps going to the left, and you're kind of constantly kind of push it to the right. You know, that is us. We are like the dodgy shopping trolley that keeps pulling in one direction, and that one direction is sin, selfishness, thinking about ourselves, anger, pride, sexual sin, all of that stuff. You have that internal stuff, shame, unforgiveness of other people, and left to our own devices, that is what we were like. But Jesus has done this. It, Peter speaks about this. He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, we have been healed. By Jesus' death on the cross, we can experience incredible forgiveness and freedom and lightness and cleansing. That sin that you cannot master, that sin that trips you up time and time again, maybe it's been doing it for years, you are forgiven from that. That is bonkers, isn't it? I would not, be, I would not do that if I was God. I'm not nice enough. But God does that. That thing that you cannot seem to move past we cannot shake. He forgives you for that when you ask him to. He wipes the slate completely clean. He lifts it off. How wonderful is that? How does it work? How does it work? How do we access that forgiveness? Because we're meant to be living free and forgiven. 
We're meant to be living light, not weighed down by our sin. We feel the weight. I mean, my shoulders are beginning to ache now, just as a little illustration. We feel the weight of it, but we're not meant to live like that. We're meant to live free and light and forgiven and be someone that knows they're forgiven and offers it to other people as well. So how does it work? 1 John 1, 9 says this. If you've never memorized this verse, this is a key verse to memorize. My, my invitation to you is, why don't you memorize this verse this week? Because it is, it is gold. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'll say it again because it's just so good. If we confess our sins, if we say to God what we've done wrong and say we're sorry, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It is a really, really sweet exchange that happens because of the cross. Not because of anything we do, but because of everything he has done. And what we have to do is we literally go to the cross. We go to Jesus at the cross and we say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. And I list, I list the stuff, lost my temper with my husband or was mean to the kids, I swore at that person. I feel, unforgiv- I feel like unforgiveness towards somebody else and I feel justified in that. The stuff I've been looking at with my eyes, the thoughts I've been having, and I just confess them to Jesus at the cross and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Please cleanse me from my sin. Give me a fresh start and a new beginning. And when we do that, he lifts it off. We experience that amazing freedom. My shoulders feel lighter immediately. I can feel the weight has gone. And I can feel the lightness. And it's hard hard to grasp sometimes because it doesn't seem too simple too easy the sweet exchange you know we need to do some penance we need to do something to make it more real well that is grace that is the beauty of grace it's not because of anything we've done but it's because of everything he has done and it is hard because on one level it feels like it's too easy on a deeper level we know it wasn't easy what Jesus did it wasn't easy for him to go to the cross it wasn't easy for him to experience a terrible pain and suffering and being separated from his father that wasn't easy but it was crucially important so we could have a relationship with God and our wrongdoing, our shame, our past mistakes our selfish actions can be removed from us and so when Jesus says to us pray forgive us our sins it's because he knows we need it we need to pray that and he has made the way for us to pray it and for it to work and for us to be forgiven he's not setting us up to fail he's setting us up to win he's setting us up for freedom and as I finish now there's a a couple of closing thoughts to leave you with if you're here and you don't know Jesus you don't know that you haven't experienced that exchange of sin being removed from you, of being welcomed into God's family and to experiencing his love, then today is the day where you can take a step to find that out, to find out who he is and is he really who I say he is and maybe your friends and family say he is. And today, today is a day to take a step and find out who Jesus is. And for those of us that are here and are Christians and you know, maybe some of you are wrestling with some cyclic sins. We all do sometimes. Some things that we have literally kind of walked with and we feel like we're never going to be able to break the cycle of this particular thing. I, I hear you and I know what that feels like, but the reality is, the truth is, God brings freedom. And God can break the chains of even cyclic sins that we feel like we can never move past. And one of the key ways to move past a cyclic sin that we are stuck in is to keep accessing God's forgiveness. Is to keep going to the cross and handing it over and asking 
for his forgiveness to come and, and being really rigorous with confession and saying to Jesus, I am sorry that I've done this again. The other way to break a cyclic sin is to confess it to somebody else. And that is the hardest thing because this can be done in secret. But James tells us to confess your sins to one another. Now, is he saying that we confess every sin to somebody else? That would take quite a long time. But um, actually, I think there is a time and a place where confessing our sins to somebody else is really important, and it's very, very powerful. It lifts it out of the secret place. It lifts, us out, of, lifts it out of the place in our mind where we feel that we're stuck here, and we confess it to someone that we can trust, who is um, for us, who loves us, who we will pray for us and keep us accountable. It is really powerful. So if that's you today, I encourage you to seek out somebody who is trustworthy and who will pray and hold you accountable. And you will find freedom. You will. Because that's a promise from, from God, a promise in Scripture, that we will be forgiven and walk free. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. And I'm going to just leave, leave a bit of time for quietness. And for you to take an opportunity to confess your sin, to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and then we'll pray a prayer. Sort of, I'll pray for us a sort of a corporate prayer of forgiveness. Let's just, you might want to close your eyes and um, just be quiet a moment. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and bring your, yeah, your conviction to us personally. Not because you want to condemn us, but because you want us to be free and walk in freedom. So please speak to our hearts. Show us where we have sinned, where we have gone wrong, done wrong, seen wrong, thought wrong. Just shine your light into our hearts and minds in, the, in this minute, we pray. Jesus, we are sorry for those things that have weighed us down and damaged our relationships with others and damaged our relationships with you. We confess now these things and ask you to come and lift them off us. We claim your incredible forgiveness, your wonderful mercy, your beautiful freedom from guilt and shame and conviction. And we say thank you so much, Jesus, for your death on the cross, which means we can be forgiven. What a beautiful, beautiful truth that we can know this morning. I ask that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit. Amen.